Today we celebrate St. Eustachia, one of the poor clares from the 1400s. I'm just going to grab her life here. She was born in, in Sicily. Her name was, as she was born, Sma, Smaragda, which means emerald. So she was an emerald before she became Eustachia. That was the religious name that she took. She was born into a wealthy family, and at, at an early age, she decided that instead of marrying, she wanted to become a poor Claire. And it, it's, it's said that her brothers wanted to burn down the convent if she persisted in being a religious. Thank God they didn't, right? But it sounds like a Sicilian family. <laughs> It's interesting that we see that she was very dedicated to God. In fact, she wanted very much so to, to live a very strict life of penance. And so she ended up leaving the, the convent that she had joined, joining another one before finally moving to um, where she ended up, where actually some of her rich benefactors um, and relatives built a new convent. Um, Monte Vergine was the name of, of that particular convent in in, just in the outskirts of Messina, so in that area. It's interesting, though, um, that the, the, the sisters were so strict that the Franciscans didn't want to say Mass there. Because if they said Mass for the nuns, they thought that they would be um, enabling pious extremes. It's very interesting to see, you know, in the spiritual life, that we do have... Sometimes some very big extremes. We have John the Baptist who seems to be always fasting, right? Then we see Jesus coming along. He's eating with everybody. He's, he's even eating with the people that if a religious were to go and eat with the sinners and the tax collectors today, they would be considered scandalous. Isn't that interesting? In fact, Jesus even comments, he says, you know, you guys, when John the Baptist came, you guys said, you know, he's, he's crazy because he's not eating. I come along, and I'm eating and drinking, and you guys say, I'm a glutton and a drunkard. But it just doesn't matter what you guys say, he says, because wisdom is confirmed by her works. We hear in the readings today, specifically this, we could say it's an encouragement by the Lord in a couple of different ways. When we see him eating and drinking with sinners and tax collectors, not to say that their lives are okay, by the way, but to say specifically that he doesn't mind being with them because he wants to bring them healing. He says, those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. I did not come to call the righteous, because they've already been called, right? But sinners. And we heard in the first reading from the book of, from the letter to the Hebrews, this beautiful thing at the end of the reading. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has already been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. This is a very beautiful phrase. If we meditate on this, what it basically says to us is this, that our weaknesses and our inabilities are not something that stop us from approaching the throne of Jesus Christ to receive his grace, which means God's aid, God's gift, God's favor. By the way, the word grace, meaning gift, it has to be freely given, otherwise it's not a gift, right? It's kind of like we could imagine parents giving a gift to, to children. Now, obviously, they're not getting that gift in order to then manipulate their child. Because if so, that's not really love and it's not really a gift, is it? At the same time, the, the, the parent might be sad if, if the child just puts the gift away and doesn't ever do anything with it. But then maybe would be pleased if that gift spurs the child to develop and to grow. And I think that's what God does with us too. God gives us gifts not to manipulate us or to guilt us and shame us to give back to him, but specifically so that we grow 
And knowing that the love he gives to us is going to cause us to be loving, we then overflow. Can you measure grace? How much grace does God give? How much grace does God give? The, the, the idea of grace, excuse me, it's endless, right? It's infinite. The idea of grace is it's God's acting on us, okay? And I think it's very interesting. Every communion we receive, not just graces, we receive God. So if you can imagine the number of graces that we need to become saints, imagine that, okay? Imagine the number of graces that maybe all of creation needs to be perfected. So you imagine that? Can you imagine? Just, I mean, without even knowing what that means, but just like imagine. Imagine that you could, you could quantify it, that you could give it a number, okay? That, the graces for all of creation to be renewed, would be one drop, one drop in the immense ocean that is the, the infinite existence of God, the, the infinite being of God. One drop, basically. And yet every time we come and, and, and celebrate sacraments, we get the entire ocean. I think this is very important. Tomorrow, um, the church in, in celebrating the Sunday of the second week of ordinary time will focus on the wedding feast at Cana, where at Mary's intercession, Jesus provides for a couple who were just simply embarrassed because they ran out of wine at a wedding. And Jesus doesn't just like produce a couple of bottles of wine. He takes six vats, huge vats, and makes it into the best wine. God is over generous, over abundant. So we want today to have that confidence that we hear in this first reading. Let us confidently approach the throne of grace. You know, it's not, you got to know somebody, right? You know, you know somebody who knows somebody. I know a guy, right? That's how, that's how we think sometimes, you know, that, that we have to know a guy in order to, you know, oh, I, I know this saint, so this saint's going to do it for me. Well, actually, we know God. And that should be enough for us. The question about knowing God up here in our heads it's a little different than what God wants us to know, which is his immense help, his immense grace here. These readings, it's encouraging me just even preaching on it. He doesn't disdain people who are in need. Jesus doesn't disdain people who, in their weakness or in their poverty or just humanly speaking, right? Just our human brokenness, our human poverty that we fall into sin. He doesn't disdain us. He comes as our good doctor. It's very important for us, though. If you go to your regular medical doctor, your medical doctor will know how to treat you based on whether you tell the doctor what's going on with you or not. Now, Jesus might know what's going on with us, and he does. But he tends to be quite a gentleman that he doesn't really kind of, he doesn't put his finger on anything without kind of asking for for permission. He might prod a little bit. He might try to get something out of us. But he won't barge in. He's a gentleman. So we want to make sure that as we confidently approach the throne of grace, not just the throne of grace, but the throne of Jesus' majesty, Jesus' glory here that becomes present here on this altar at this mass. And then that we get transformed into because he comes into us in communion. We become the throne of his glory, the throne of his grace. We want to make sure that that confidence is the same kind of confidence that you would with a doctor that you know for years and you tell everything to. This is what's wrong with me. This is what's going on. Help me out. Amen.